This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. This week, a class comparing several First Lady's memoirs, from Sarah Polk to Michelle Obama. It's taught by Peter Castor of Washington University. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you all doing? Great. Thank you. Glad to hear it. So uh, in previous weeks, of course, we've begun by talking about the election. This is actually the first week in several weeks when there has not been a momentous change in the presidential election in the previous 48 hours. So I think we can get right down to work with the material we'll be discussing today. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, what we're going to be doing today is discussing the memoirs or memoir type materials we read from Edith Wilson, from Sarah Polk, from Betty Ford, and from Michelle Obama. We're going to try to make sense of how these first ladies understood their lives as first ladies. And this is part of our larger consideration of the presidency as a lived experience for presidents, for their families, for those around them. And after we go through the material that you all read, what I hope we can do is connect that to the memoirs you previously read about uh, by Richard Nixon, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama. Uh, my goal here is not just, again, to bring together our what we've been learning about the presidency as a lived experience, but also to think about memoir. Because that's, of course, the way a lot of Americans learn about their presidents. They read the books that those presidents and first ladies wrote. And my hope is today we can make sense of how those all operate together. Before we get into them, though, I want to ask all of you a question, or a series of questions. Because we're talking now about the notion of a private life for presidents and for their families. So let's begin by defining what areas of our lives we would normally consider to be private that are not the property of the public domain. And I'm not asking you to share anything from your private lives, obviously. I'm not sharing anything from mine. But what I'm wondering is, what areas of one's life do you consider to be fundamentally private? Nobody's business, unless you choose to disclose it. Health. Your health, absolutely, Thomas. What else? Relationships. What's that? Relationships. Relationships. Defined in many ways. Mm -hmm. What else? Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Income. Income, your finances. Mm -hmm. Like children and families. Yeah, what goes, so, but that's a little different. Was that what you were thinking of, Richard, when you said relationships? No, I meant like marriages and stuff like that. Romantic and intimate relationships. And Lydia, you're talking about family relationships. Anything else that comes to mind? Personal struggles. Yeah, personal struggles. Great point. Um, your academics and your grades. Yes, I hadn't even thought of that. Almost every one of these, in fact, is protected by law. What protects your health? Do you know? Um, I mean, like HIPAA violations? Yeah. Do you know what HIPAA actually stands for? I do not. Anybody? Sometimes you do. No, it's more it refers to the, was it the health information? Privacy or something. Exactly. What protects your academic information? I'm not sure. It's another acronym, FERPA. FERPA? Yes, exactly. So for example, if your parents contact me and ask how you're doing, I can't tell them how awesome you're doing um, unless you give me permission to do so. So those are protected by law. What about your financial information? Well, that's also protected by law. Uh, financial institutions are prohibited from disclosing your personal financial information. Relationships are a different matter. They're not protected by law, but they are to some degree protected by custom. Do presidents enjoy, at least the presidency now, do presidents and their families enjoy privacy in any of these areas? Richard, you're shaking your head. Finances to a certain extent. Can you, I'm sorry, Chloe, can you repeat? Finances to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Finances. To a certain extent. Mm -hmm. To what extent? I mean, technically, they don't have to relate to their finances, but there's so much public pressure that they basically do. Right. And what financial information 
have presidential families disclosed? Tax returns. Tax returns. Famously, they disclose their tax returns. Sometimes they disclose their earnings. Sometimes they disclose additional financial information. Or at least that has been the prevailing norm since the 1970s. And that's part of what made Donald Trump's decision to disclose almost none of his private financial information so disruptive because previous presidents had not done that. Any other areas where presidents enjoy privacy? Well, some relationships that are not really in the public eye, like Trump to his younger son Barron instead of Trump to Trump Jr. and Eric. I guess there's a difference between those two. So what's the difference between there are many differences between Donald Trump Jr. and Baron Trump as individuals, but why, were they, why are they treated differently? There's not really much of an interest in, the, in that relationship. Also, the people kind of respect the father-son relationship with Baron as a child instead of mm. Trump Jr. as an adult or acting as an adult. Mm -hmm. Could everyone hear that? Yeah. Uh, I think that's a really good point. So it's not so much the individuals, it's the age. What do you think would be the age at which a president's child no longer enjoys that veil of privacy. I think it just has to do with schooling. Like, I think that if, if a president's child is like out of school and like not in an area where they're surrounded by other people like of the same age, um, like maybe like once they graduate college, then they're no longer treated as like a child. Presidential children in general enjoy a degree of privacy and we need to say from who. So specifically, journalists have said they would not intrude on the private lives of presidential children. They do to some degree, but usually not until they are in their 20s. And the interesting thing, so who's the Trump child who really tests that? It's not Don Jr. or Eric or Ivanka, all of whom have taken on public roles. It's not Barron. Tiffany Trump, who's right at that point. Uh, absolutely. It's part of what makes the Trump presidency so different. Because for the quarter century preceding his election, all of the presidents came into office with young children. Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, they all had young children that enjoyed some degree of privacy. The real question is to what degree presidents and their families have chosen to put their private lives on public display. And I want to see if we can figure that out now. And the way I'd like to do it is to actually start with uh, the, the written material from four first ladies, Sarah Polk, Edith Wilson, Betty Ford, Michelle Obama. They span, you know, they go from the mid 19th century through the early 21st century. And the interesting thing is when you all listed areas where presidents don't have privacy, they are in some of the areas that we consider most private. Intimate relationships, finances, family, health, all of these are often considered within the public domain. So let's look at how these first ladies sought to mediate that relationship. So what I want to do is, what I want to get a sense of from you is first of all, how you can bring these memoirs together. What are the key themes of these memoirs? Before we do that, let's make sure we're all on the same page with who we're talking about here. This is going to be uh, a quiz of sorts from early in the semester to see if you can remember who served when. So, Sarah Polk. Married to? And it's interesting, everyone knows the middle name, James K. Polk. And she served as first lady from when to when? 1845. Now, that, excellent. And I'm actually going to put, rather than sort of putting it to the dates of the Wilson presidency, we're going to look at it in terms of how she defined this in her piece. Because we know Woodrow Wilson serves from 1913 to 1921. But her, her way of making sense of the timing of his presidency is, I think, actually going to be really useful for understanding this. OK. Of course, Betty Ford.
serves as first lady from when to when? Ah, you've already gotten it several times. You're doing all the hard work. What about the rest of you? What's that? 1976. You're so close. 77. Excellent. 1974 to 1977. And finally, Michelle Obama. Serves as first lady from when to when. You all know this. 2009 to 2017. Excellent. By the way, how many of you had read a portion of Michelle Obama's memoir before this semester? Had you read any of these other books? You hadn't read Sarah Polk's Reminiscences? No? Don't you, now that you've read a portion of it, don't you want to rush out and read the rest of it? Yeah, you're ready to roll? OK, yeah, I'll keep that in mind. Excellent. All right, so you all got this down. We're going to spend some time on Edith Wilson as we get to it to answer that question. But before doing that, here's my question. As you think about both these memoirs as written objects and about the experience of First Ladies, what are the key themes that draw their experiences together? These are four very different women living in profoundly different times. So you can find the differences pretty easily. Let's start with the similarities. Um, I feel like all of them sort of like had a sense of like, I'm just an ordinary woman that was like in this extraordinary role and sort of like the sense of like, um, like this could happen to anyone, yet it like happened to me. Mm-hmm. And that's a great con way to contrast it. Ordinary person in extraordinary circumstances. My indecipherable handwriting. Anybody else? I think there's a common discussion of transition. Transitioning from mm. the president before them, but also to the president after them and the first lady after them. I think this was definitely important in Michelle Obama, she was talking with Laura Bush, but also Melania Trump, and she really illuminated that. So I think that's important to talk about. And my hope is that at the end of class today, we can talk about the presidential transition, because what could be more timely? All right, ordinary, extraordinary, the transition. What else? What are some other key, uh, common themes in these? What, the stress of elections? Yeah. And more generally, the stress of politics, most intensely during the campaign. What else? Um, individuality, which we like from mm. the president to themselves. Oh, so their individuality within the presidential couple. Yeah. Mm. Okay. That's a great point. These are all great. Is there anything else, though, we want to get on the list before we begin, before we get at each one of these? General familial relationships, like yeah. with, with their kids or with their husbands. I want to break that up into two subjects. Marriage, parenting. Definitely connected, totally different. And both of them, each of them affects the other, and not always for the better. So um, marriage and parenting. Anything else? I mean, I think this might fall under individuality, but like each, there's no clear role for the first lady, so each one kind of can fall into their own whatever realm they want to go. Yeah, so let's say defining the role. Right. So I'm going to say, start with defining the role. And I think, Thomas, we can explain that in contextual terms, because that's very much defined by the, 
that's one area where we'll really see the differences emerging in terms of when they uh, become first lady. One of the interesting things is that when you mention the transition, former presidents are actually very important cultural figures. But nowhere in the Constitution is it defined that the former president has a role. Likewise, first ladies have served a role, both public and private, for almost every president. Um, and yet nowhere in the Constitution does it define, is a role for them established. Of course, the Constitution itself, in its original incarnation, is almost completely silent on women. It is only through amendment that the Constitution articulated a role for women in, uh, in, American po in the American political system. One thing I would ask you, when I say almost every president had a first lady, there's only one president who didn't. But not every president, not every first lady was the president's wife. So that may sound like a trick question. So first of all, who's the only president without a first lady? Do you know? Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland got married while he was president. He's the, I believe he's the only president to be married in office. And she immediately, his wife, immediately assumed all of the, at that time, traditional roles of a first lady. Wasn't it uh, uh, James Buchanan who had like a really good uh, best friend? So James, so James Buchanan, Buchanan was never was married. married. And both in his own time and in our time, uh, a lot of people focus very much on his relationship with Rufus King, who had been a vice president in a previous administration and who died before Buchanan was elected. At that time, observers claimed that theirs was an inappropriate relationship to be made fun of. Historians have increasingly come to conclude that Buchanan was probably gay and this was probably a romantic relationship. But what's crucial is that part of what made Buchanan's administration seem unusual was that there was no first lady. So who was first lady during Thomas Jefferson's administration? He was a widower. What was he going to do for a first lady? His daughter. Absolutely. His daughter served that role. My point is the role has been so important. It is so assumed that there will be a first lady that it need not be the president's spouse, but rather there should be some woman in the White House who plays that role, all right? So let's talk about how the individual first ladies we looked at addressed these subjects. And in doing that, I think we'll really understand the role of the first lady. Which one do you want to start with? Which do you think is most important or most interesting? And if not, I will pick one. I think defining the role is really important. Defining the role. So how did these first ladies, what was the role that they defined for themselves? And in this case, they're not all the same. So I think, Will, that's a great one to start with because this kind of enables us to walk through each one of them. What did these women do as first ladies? What was their job? And they clearly think it's a job. Well, Michelle Obama knows that she was a mom in chief in her family. And she definitely took on the role of being a mother first, but she did a lot to like her let's play or her campaign with fighting or combating childhood obesity. Mm -hmm. uh, that was like one of her big roles. She also like, made sure to make the White House livable. Like she had a garden, she modernized the, like the interior and stuff, so. Mm -hmm. but her, yeah. mm -hmm. um, what I found like most interesting about like Betty Ford's, like the piece we read about that, a bit, how, was about like how interested and like invested she was in, in like the feminist and women's rights movement and about how sometimes she even like, w like not went against, but like did things that her husband didn't particularly agree with. And I think like her role, she took on like maybe a more political role than like some of the other first ladies mm -hmm. and she was more independent. 
both of your, your comments actually are really good together because yours is very much about the role of first ladies within the private domain of the White House. Whereas Lydia, yours is very much about the role of first ladies in the public realm outside, uh, in American politics, outside of the White House. So maybe, let's, let's talk a little more about that one. Based on the material you've got, is there a, a consistent public role for first ladies? What do they do? They're kind of like a head of state, like a ceremonial head of state, especially for the earlier first ladies. Like for Sarah Polk, she was mainly, she was really revered as um, kind of the head of the White House and how the White House was run. And it kind of evolved into more of a head of a, of a certain issue or a certain group as they got to Betty Ford and to Michelle Obama. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I definitely agree that there was some sort of a progression. I think when we were, uh, Polk was the first one that I read and you kind of understand the first lady in the public domain as somebody that like is there to entertain somebody there to take the guests of the president and to I think there was one line that she said like dress up or put on a dress and go to the moat like the ball or something like that but I think as we saw throughout time started to redefine with Betty Ford when she really took something that she was passionate about and tr sought to capitalize on it in the public realm and then again Michelle Obama like redefined what that was she she's like I to goes back to Thomas's point about the mom and chief, she didn't want to just be there as somebody that was going to take on a passive role and just entertain. She wanted to take her own passions to exercise those uh, in the public eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also feel as though the role is kind of like um, trying to express a role model, and that changed in different time periods. Um, I feel like you were saying how earlier on it might have been being more complacent and um, just supporting your husband, the president. And then later on, like you could see with Michelle Obama, it was more like through your public actions and through what you support. And um, it's just stuff like that, like more role model in public life too. Well, and Jackie, part of what's crucial about the point you've made is that what I like is that it's not just a negative role or it's not just the absence of a role, that even if Sarah Polk is less engaged politically, she is still functioning as a role model but in this case, as a role model of a rather, to model what at that time were traditional gendered norms about the, the space that women should operate in within the public sphere and the private sphere. Um, what, I guess one way to get at it would be to think, when you think about Michelle Obama and Betty Ford, you know, they both have a cause. You know, every first lady now has a cause. And Michelle Obama starts by kind of listing what some recent first ladies had identified as their causes. Um, this is moving outside of these specific sources, but which first lady, do you have any idea which first lady was the first to truly articulate a public cause for herself? Was it Nancy Reagan? So it's before Nancy Reagan, but what's her cause? I don't remember. Oh, it's a good one, and it's got a slogan. Do oh, you know? That's an organization, but that's not the slogan. Hugs, not drugs. What's that? Hugs, not drugs. Hugs, not drugs is one thing she said, but that, so it's an anti-drug message, but that's not her motto. Do you know what the motto was? Clearly, you are not children of the 1980s. Because ask your parents, they'll know it. What's that? Just say no. Excellent. So you're clearly older than you appear on the screen. So just say no was the tagline. And not only did she say it publicly, she went on TV shows where she, you know, on sitcoms. She famously does an appearance on Different Strokes, which is a 80s sitcom, deeply problematic in many ways. Um, but she has this uh, anti-drug message, but she's not the first. Because, of course, Betty Ford predates her. So some people would argue about this. It's probably Eleanor Roosevelt. Because Eleanor Roosevelt says she's going to play a public role in helping to foster uh, morale and, in the response to the Great Depression in World War II. Now, her, the first ladies um, during the Truman, you know, Mamie Eisenhower doesn't really have a cause for herself, but she serves in a slightly more public role 
And then beginning with Jackie Kennedy, every first lady has something they're going to do. So Michelle Obama, what's her cause? Healthy eating. Healthy eating. Absolutely. Laura Bush. Do you know? Was she bullying? What's that? Was that, was that bullying? She was against bullying? No. And of course, ironically, that's Melania's cause. Cyberbullying. Be best. Hers was literacy, which makes sense because she'd been a librarian. That literacy had been very much part of her professional life. Lady Bird Johnson, it's going to be the beautification of the country at the same time that Lyndon Johnson wants to build these institutions of, uh, that will provide social services to Americans. She said, we need institutions that will develop us culturally and we need to beautify this country. So these are individual causes, but let's get into some more of the brass tacks about whether these first ladies are operating within the conventional realm of politics by which I mean, are they part of a policy-making structure in any way? Right. So, go ahead, Tom. I know that Michelle Obama, she made sure to separate herself from East Wing and West Wing. Mm -hmm. She even notes that like, she made sure to never, or to only have the staffs communicate when it kind of came for like policy in terms mm -hmm. of that. And she does note that Hillary Clinton did do, got, was, much more involved and was trying to stay involved, but yeah. So why doesn't she just follow Hillary Clinton's model? Well, I think that, I mean, obviously they're different presidencies and stuff, so I think that Michelle Obama took the role of kind of being more individual in terms of her goals and stuff, and yeah. Yeah. Michelle Obama very clearly states she has no political aspirations, where obviously that is not true for Hillary Clinton. Like Absolutely. She really wanted to be involved in her husband presidency and later in her career. And that is something that all of these women say in one way or another. I have no personal political aspirations. They're still part of the political realm, and we'll, we'll figure that out. One of the reasons Michelle Obama needed to do this as well is that at first glance, she seemed very similar to Hillary Clinton. Really smart, highly successful attorney who had built a career even as her husband was beginning a political career. But there had been a widespread reaction against Hillary Clinton's public role during the Clinton administration. Bill Clinton puts her in charge of the uh, health care reform initiative. And part of the criticism of that was from people saying, I did not vote for Hillary Clinton. She does not hold an elected office. This is not appropriate for the First Lady. And so Michelle Obama explicitly states after her term as First Lady and implicitly makes clear during her term as First Lady that she's not going to operate in the way that Hillary Clinton did. Because in other ways, they were, again, very similar. Uh, the Obamas have two young daughters in the White House. The Clintons had one young daughter in the White House. They were very similar family demands. But let's get back to the political role of first ladies. And I actually want to go back to Sarah Polk. And I want to challenge you by saying, I would argue that Sarah Polk has a really important political role. I don't think she's, she doesn't fully articulate it in, the, in, um, in this book. And notice this, this is sort of based on her materials. It's not something she wrote as a memoir. Um, but there is a public role for her, or rather a political role. What is it? How does she spend her time? Network with other, with the wives of other politicians. Mm -hmm. Like help her husband form connections. Yeah, and let's figure out how we get to that. So again, if you look, if you think about these individual entries, what is she doing all day? And this is part of what makes it tough to read. It seems really redundant and monotonous. What's she doing? She's receiving visitors at the White House. Mm -hmm. You said she's going to dinners. Who are the visitors? Who's at the dinners? Colleagues of her husband. Colleagues of her husband, competitors of her husband. 
we're now in that dreadful realm of mid 19th century politics where these guys all look the same. Were there any names you recognized? Clay. Henry Clay. They don't. And what's her attitude towards Clay? Do you remember? She kind of uh, she says she hopes that he has success, even though that she's really usually against uh, her husband's platform. Right. In the next election. Right, because they had competed. Yeah. You know, Clay's the leader of the Whig Party. Polk's the leader of the Democrats. Clay famously says, uh, the Whigs will only nominate me when they know they're going to lose. So she's kind of dismissive of Henry Clay. But he's still kicking around. We read about him in 1817. He's still kicking around in 1845. He's there forever. And there's another guy who we also, who's another holdover from the Monroe administration who's still around in 1845. John C. Calhoun is still there. And what is Sarah Polk doing with John C. Calhoun? It's really difficult because it's exactly the stuff you would normally skip over. Was it the whole thing with like England? What's that? Was it the whole thing with like England? Was that the Calhoun part? Like yeah, where they're trying to talking about it, but, but, what? but what? Do you see a role for Sarah Polk in that? Think about. Go, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Nate. She's trying to like communicate what Polk's message is to Calhoun, like in like sort of a nicer way. It seems. Mm -hmm. like, Absolutely. So she's serving, serving a lot of crucial roles here. In some cases, she is interpreting the communication of one president to another, or one politician to another. But also, even though these presidents are, they obviously have some interpersonal skills, they're also kind of dysfunctional with each other. They, you know, they argue, they get in fights, they've got personality limitations. You can picture her at any one of these dinners, calming the waters, making nice, building social connections. Part of this we know from the first lady who was one of the most effective social operators and was married to a president who was one of the worst. John, uh, excuse me, it's not John C. Calhoun, I apologize. It's John Quincy Adams. So remember, how did you all characterize John Quincy Adams when we read from his autobiography? How you, as a person? Entitled. Entitled, uh-huh. What else? Arrogant, really impressed with himself. Obnoxious, complaining constantly. So Louisa Adams, his wife, first finds this role for herself when he's the US minister to Russia. And John Quincy Adams is always the smartest guy in the room intellectually and the dumbest guy in the room interpersonally. And he knows it. So she works the room. She identifies who he needs to talk with. She puts out fires when they emerge socially. And as first lady, she continues to do this work. And you can really see Sarah Polk doing this. Now, I would ask you, does Edith Wilson, do you, where do we see this in Edith Wilson's uh, narrative of her time in the White House? And if you need to, take a moment to revisit it. What does she spend her time doing? She does name like shipping vessels, the, the EDA, German ships in the ports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She does like talk a lot about like the war and stuff. Yeah. She, she sews Red Cross uh, gear and fabrics that they're going to wear. She volunteers, and Jackie, to get to your point, she models the notion that American citizens should be volunteering for the cause. How do you think, when she's not doing that though, how, how does she seem to be spending her days? She goes horseback riding. She does go horseback riding. <laughs> I think she's from an old Virginia family, the bowling family. There, there are a lot of horse riders in that family. see in 
his reelection, how the daughters burst in, or like, how does no one support our dad? But she's sort of supporting him and expecting and preparing him for the worst. And she, I can assume she does that throughout his presidency when he's. Um, she quotes him, Woodrow Wilson is saying, and I, this really struck me, I know that the emotional drain and the work combined were too much for me. You know, she really sees being president as taking a toll on Wilson and her job is to support him. And we see that in Sarah Polk and that is not to be dismissed. That actually serves an important role. And of course, so this carries us through the war. What happens to Woodrow Wilson after the war? Do you know? And this gets us into that realm of private, of what is private and what could or sh could not be public. He suffers a stroke. And this, at a t and the stroke affects his cognition and his movement at a time where there's an enormous stigma attached to disability. Now, do you know what happens after he suffers this stroke? I can't, which one of you drew Wilson is the movie that you're gonna watch this year? What's that? Who got it? Oh, that's right. That's right, you're the lucky guy. That, that movie doesn't deal with this at all. He withdraws from public life, and he doesn't hold a cabinet meeting, he doesn't give public addresses, and his contact with the outside world is mediated by one or two very close advisors and by Edith Wilson. So she suddenly becomes a gatekeeper. Nancy Reagan played the same role. And what's really interesting is normally if someone suffered a stroke, family would, would gather around and ideally support that person, but it would be nobody's business. And yet here, this issue of health is looking historically assumed to be something appropriate uh, for the public domain, that Americans really sh had a right to know whether their president was able to do his job or whether the stroke prevented him from doing so. I emphasize both Sarah Polk and Edith Wilson because with Betty Ford and Michelle Obama, the public roles for them are more clear. But also they keep talking about how their role is to support the president in a manner that they say isn't just personal, it's actually rather public. So that then begs the question, if we return to this, so we've talked about defining the role. Um, we've talked a bit about the stresses of politics. Well, let's get to your question about individuality and about whether these first ladies imagine or even try to imagine a space for themselves separate from their husbands. Do any of them try to do that? Ford uh, Obama did. What's that? Ford and Obama did. Ford and Obama did. And how do they do that? Uh, so for Obama, she kind of separates himself, herself, um, ge like geographically, like physically, like she's in the East Wing most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and Ford does it by supporting issues like abortion rights and women's rights that Gerald Ford doesn't really support politically or isn't really advocate for politically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. See all of you nodding, that's good. Anything else that you want to add to that? Anything else that any of you observed where it seems like the first lady is articulating a space for herself or grappling with what it means to lose that sense of self? This, uh, you. Uh, I guess Michelle Obama talks about how the way they referred to her, like they would throw in Harvard educated, but that was kind of it. Like, I think she tried to somewhat make herself like individualized from her husband, but the press seemed to just um, refer to her as Barack Obama's. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. And she says, I had had this career. And that was my identity, and suddenly that was gone. Uh, and that's a really important part of the, she opens it with that. It's a really important part of the book. Absolutely. Anybody want to add, were you going to add something to that, Jacob, or was that the point? This might like, underscore defining the role a little bit more, but I think, especially in discussion of when they're 
first moving in, there's all this discussion about what should I wear, or there's discussion of how they're going to develop the interior view of the White House. Um, and in terms of like individuality, I think that's not really a topic that we, I, I read about Richard Nixon for the presidential memoirs that certainly wasn't just like talked about as, as, a, as an important topic. Um, so I think defining or defining the role in individuality kind of come together on this one and, and like it's their role as an individual to, mm. or like stereotypically it's their role as an individual to want to redefine what it looks like in the White House. Um, and they're always thinking about what they should wear and Michelle Obama definitely reinvents that role, I think yeah. in my opinion. She does, but you're right. Each one of these memoirs, especially hers and Ford's talk about this, and it's a way that the First Lady memoir gives us access to something that the presidential memoir totally does not. My guess is you wonder, what is it like to be the president? And the memoirs didn't talk as, uh, by the presidents, didn't talk as much about that first day in the White House. You know, what it's like to actually move in there. The First Lady does that. And increasingly, that is a crucial role of the First Lady, which is just to manage the White House in many ways, which is an increasingly elaborate um, uh, existence. Barack Obama went on Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. Have, 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 how many of you have seen or heard of that program? All right, I'm really distressed that you have not. So what is Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee? Or at least the one that I've seen, Jerry Seinfeld uh, picks up Obama in like an old, old retro car and they just drive around. Mm -hmm. They go to get coffee and they're just like, Seinfeld's kind of riffing him, giving him jokes about his presidency, but it ends in a more like political oriented manner. But the series is generally one in which Jerry Seinfeld, only now would you have a show like this. Jerry Seinfeld interviews a, usually a comedian in a car that he sees as somehow reflective of that comedian. And they go out and get coffee. And that may, it's, a, it's another show about nothing. But it's done very well, and he had one with Obama, and Obama says the big, the most difficult moment was the first night in the White House, which just seemed unreal and amazing, but you usually don't have presidents talking about that. First ladies do that. So this issue of individuality definitely shows up in them. We will get to the transition, but I want to hold off on that. When we talk about marriage and parenting, let's bracket that also within those most private areas of life that you all identified. Family, intimate relationships, health, finances. Perhaps we can start with marriage and parenting. That's about family. Again, what do these memoirs say about what it's like to be first lady when it comes to marriage and to parenting? Well, they often talk about how it is really hard to be a parent in the White House, and I think Michelle Obama and um, Betty Ford talk the most about it, but I think they all feel kind of like guilty that they're putting their kids in this position where they're like all of a sudden so much in the public eye. Absolutely, it's a great point. It's also different from Sarah Polk and especially Edith Wilson because Wilson's children are grown, they're her stepchildren, um, Polk's kids are grown. Um, the Ford kids are kind of grown, they're older, but the Obama girls are really young when he gets elected. So yeah, they say it's really difficult. What else do they say about parenting? Michelle Obama especially put an emphasis on um, wanting to maintain normalcy and just give her children the most normal and, and not average, but um, as they had before, their childhood, their schooling, their friends, their, their school relationships, everything like that. She wanted to really maintain it mm -hmm. just as they had before. An ordinary family in extraordinary circumstances. Absolutely. What about marriage? Do they talk about that much at all? this is also going back to individuality, that everyone was appalled that she wanted to sleep in the same room and let alone the same bed as her husband, which had never been done before. 
So that was also well, it had not mean, never been done before. Never been publicly discussed, discussed by a first lady because there was the separate bedroom for the first lady that um, Obama also made light of, and sort of a room where she could be. Right. But it also talks about marriage more publicly, saying, "I'm not just my husband's wife that's over here. I'm actually with him." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's important in a court case to remember that, like all of the other first ladies, like they they also make this whole deal about, okay, I'm not a political figure. Like I never really signed up for this in terms of like marrying a president and stuff like that. But quite literally like even Ford didn't really sign up for this. Like he was, he was a vice president, but he just got thrust into the presidency and all of a sudden like Betty Ford just gets her life flipped upside down. So like in terms of like sleeping in the same bed and like having like their relationship in the public eye, she really wasn't expecting this at all. And that's like the biggest part of like the beginning of her, I have the excerpt that we read from her is that. Absolutely. absolutely Basically, private life is suddenly and unexpectedly taken away from her. That's why she talks about him becoming president. At, you know, she's very proud of him, but nonetheless, it is this painful and disruptive moment in their family's lives. So those are some ways that they talk about marriage, about parenting, uh, anything else about marriage that you can think of. I want to make sure we cover all of these in the details that you remember. Um, we kind of see the marriage, especially in Betty Ford and Michelle Obama's memoirs, like in a more tender way with more tender moments than we would from the president, really. Mm -hmm. like, um, like we talked about with how they wanted to sleep in the same bed. Betty Ford says she likes sleeping in the same bed as her husband. Michelle Obama says she likes, you know, having date night dinners with her husband. And it's really private and it's, it's really tender. So when the Obamas went out on that date, that was a big, big deal. It generated national coverage, the notion that the presidential couple would go out for dinner. And at the moment, it seemed kind of nuts that everyone was so fascinated by this. But in retrospect, of course they would. You know, it speaks to how unusual this is. So we started with one of you saying they describe them. Maybe it was, it was you who were saying they describe themselves as, as ordinary families in extraordinary circumstances. You've mentioned some examples of that. What are some other ways that first ladies address that? I have one more comment about marriage. Sure. Um, I mean, Michelle Obama, like I would, one word to describe, I would say like the first lady and president's relationship is like the first lady is very supportive at all times, or at least tries to. But one thing Michelle Obama notes, Michelle Obama notes is that she is going to rekindle like her love with Obama, with Barack Obama, like after their presidency and like she, <laughs> even says like a month after they just went on walks and were totally like removed from any kind of public realm or tried to. Think about how disclosing that is. We talked about this, the veil of privacy that many people want. And the notion that a first lady would put in a book her aspirations for her romantic relationship with her husband, emphasizing he's not the president, he's my husband is a pretty remarkable public disclosure of one's private life. So all of this is made public. They don't talk about finances all that much. Do they talk about health at all? Betty Ford talks about cancer. Mm -hmm. Also her alcoholism and drug abuse at the her alcoholism mm -hmm. and this isn't like directly like financial but like michelle obama did like talk a lot about how like they like how their personal family like paid for a lot of the stuff in the white house versus stuff like that so i guess i wasn't like disclosing their like financial records or anything but i was sort of talking about like just financial aspects of the job but it's an important thing for her to say which is we are not profiting from this public role she also says several times, you know, I, I came from a family of modest means. So her family financial history is, if it's not recounted in dollars and cents, it is recorded. Now, what I would ask you, perhaps as a point of comparison, is whether, is, we've, you've all suggested ways that presidents wrote about their lives and experiences differently. Let's put these together. And let's see if they can, now I realize we don't quite have the same presidents and first ladies aligning, but let's talk about these two types of books, presidential memoirs, first lady memoirs, and how they come together to help us understand the presidency. 
What are the common themes between them? The differences we'll get to. The more difficult part is what are the common themes? They talk about their family life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are finding like publicly perceived failures. What's that? We are finding like um, policy or mistakes that were viewed very negatively by the public and explaining the context behind them. Mm -hmm. And also flip that on its head. What else do they do? They don't just talk about their failures. They, talk about their they really like to talk. The president really likes to talk about their successes. The first ladies love to write about their husband's successes. There's actually less discussion of failure in these accounts by first ladies than there is of success. What are some of the other connections? a lot about how he like viewed himself as like an ordinary person even though like his father was president but like still I feel like that idea of like the contrast between like an ordinary person and extraordinary circumstances was like brought up in the presidential memoirs. And that's it's great that you mentioned George W. Bush because few people are less ordinary than George W. Bush. He's he's born to a millionaire. His father not only has a long has a brief electoral career in elected politics, but an extended career in high levels of appointed office. He's vice president and then he's president. That ain't ordinary. But yet George W. Bush still sees himself that way. Did any of the other memoirs that you read by presidents tell that same story of ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances? Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon did. He, like, he grew up in Yorba Linda, and he grew up in like, a rural family or more rural life. And he, he definitely stressed how he was an ordinary person. And I mean, he rightfully so was. Mm -hmm. Jacob, were you, you, I saw you. I don't, like, for me, there was some, like, I agree with Thomas. We both read about Nixon. But to a certain extent, I feel like there was a certain like arrogance in his writing as if uh, there was some line when he was like, oh, the Midwest is flyover country or something like that, or like people don't really care about that. So I think there was almost this like sense of like he was part of a greater being or like th this came to him and you know, like he was ready for this role because he was above everybody else. I don't know if that comes off in like a conceited tone, but I think he might not have considered himself like ordinary or like part of the, the flyover area. I don't Did he come across that? Cause you also read the Nixon yeah, memoir. Yeah. Um, Did he come across that way to you? I mean, definitely when he discussed like his policies and successes and failed, or he never quoted failures, but his successes, I, I got that tone. But I don't know, I don't, I'm not so sure about when he like early life kind of thing. We read well, different parts of the book, so. Yeah. True, yeah. but also, doesn't this kind of confirm with, the, with what David Gergen wrote in his book about, about Nixon's person? How does Gergen describe Nixon? Do you remember? Very intellectual, but socially, like, kind of inept. Really smart, socially inept, full of himself. I mean, it, it radiates from the memoir. So, Jacob, I'd agree with you that Nixon definitely often thought he was the smartest guy in the room. Presidents have a way of feeling that way about themselves. Gary Hart, who ran for president, uh, once said that when he got elected to the Senate, and he said, this is a common malady. You get elected to the Senate, and you think, oh my gosh, how can I be here? Then you think, how the heck did all these guys get here? And as soon as you think that, you start thinking, I'm smart enough to be president because I'm the smartest guy in the room. But at the same time, so maybe if Nixon isn't an ordinary guy, what makes his circumstances ordinary? Um, well, he grew up to like a relatively poor family, mm -hmm. and I mean, he had a pretty normal, like, come up. I mean, he was de he definitely, like, persevered because he did attend, like, the college and he was the first one in his family to. Right. So, I mean, he definitely kind of lived the American dream, per se. Mm-hmm. 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 What, uh, what about the other presidents you studied? How do they make the case for their experience and how that matters? The Obama memoir, I felt like it was just... Like, it felt like the opposite. It almost felt like he was building up his personality so much. And he was building up, like, how his circumstances, like, formed him into this, like, 
kind of different person and more of like a um, like his own entity. Mm-hmm. And his circumstances were rather ordinary throughout a lot of the book. Like he was kind of having to make the opposite case of, okay, I'm this person who's like highly qualified for all these positions that I'm doing. And like, I've gone through all these life experiences that have made me this certain way, but my circumstances are just like everyone else's have. So, and I think you're spot on in talking about him. So then how do you align that book with Nixon? Does, Does he share anything with Nixon? And I actually think that he does other than the fact that they both became president and they were both smart. And if you can't figure it out from those, I think it'll become clear as we get through the rest of them. Bill Clinton into the mix. You read that thousand page memoir of his. You, you better get, you know, you deserve to get something from it. A wealthy background or anything. Mm. Um, so he definitely like was an ordinary person, but then also by the time he was in office as president, he had worked as like attorney general of Arkansas and then governor of Arkansas. So he kind of like became more into power and politics as he got older, but definitely like as a child. Okay. I think that's a terrific point that Clinton also talks about these modest circumstances. He also has to find a, have to, ha, they all have to do a certain kind of humble brag, you know, where they say, you know, I was, I just, I wanted to help the people. And I think every president does. But at the same time, they do like to announce their accomplishments. That's something the first ladies can't do. There seems to be a greater expectation of modesty in the memoir. They may or may not be modest individuals, but the memoir is modest. So, but I think that's a great point about Clinton. You know, I'm not sure where Carter fits in this. You read Carter's memoir. For those of you who read it, where does Carter fit in this? candidacy as being such a Washington outsider, being from Georgia, but at the same time, he didn't come from the same place as like a Bill Clinton who talks so much about poverty. And so he's this weird in between, Mm -hmm. and he doesn't necessarily have the same intellectual ability as someone like Nixon, and he doesn't sound arrogant in that way because he doesn't, and that's how so much of the American people viewed him also. So he's this very weird, ambiguous case to me. He is. And one of the things, though, that you mentioned, that your group mentioned in their paper that was so interesting is that, is the way Carter goes in his memoir to, he self-consciously seeks to describe this private life, especially this married life that he and uh, Rosalind have in the White House, and describes a kind of counterpoint to what Michelle Obama says, which is that they are trying to maintain a loving and romantic marriage, despite the demands, the separation, the stresses of being president. But I think you're right, that he's somewhere in between. But no president writes in his memoir, I was born to be president. We'll soon be reading that first biography of George Washington, uh, Mason Locke Weems' book. And Weems would have you believe George Washington is literally born ready to be president. In their memoirs, presidents never say that. One thing you've all said is every one of these presidents in the memoir says, here is the struggle I faced as a child or at some point in my life. What's Nixon's struggle? Born into poverty. Yeah. What's Obama's struggle? Developing his own racial identity. Developing his own racial identity and also growing, growing up in a family that really struggles, you know? Um, he barely knows his father. His parents are separated. There's a second marriage that doesn't succeed. But understa- the, the quest to understand himself is a huge part of that narrative. With Carter, there's even some degree of that as well, kind of coming to terms with his own faith. What about George W. Bush? Because frankly, at first glance, there's not much struggle in the life of George W. Bush. We should all be so lucky to be born into the privileges of George W. Bush. He talks about um, alcoholism and how 
alcoholism and that's like his principal struggle and he kind of uses that to transition into faith and how he realized how important faith was in his life. And how does he overcome alcoholism? Through faith. Through faith, which is a kind of generic phrase, he becomes religious. So for each of these presidents, in the books they wrote, one of the major claims they make is that this, this trial, this challenge, either of their childhood or their early adulthood, is what is going to forge them to become presidents, that it's going to make them better people. But they do it in a way very similar to the First Ladies. You know, they don't say, it's not George Washington. It's not commanding the Continental Army prepared me to be president. It's something very personal, something very individual, and something that any other American might face. And so the question I would ask you, this is the big one, and I'll admit, it's one of these questions where I have a very specific answer in mind, but it's really crucial to what we're doing this semester. As I said, I want us to understand not just the presidents and first ladies, but the memoirs that they wrote. This notion of ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances, what does that say about the presidency? And you're giving me that look that says, what is he thinking? I want to make clear, if you get it wrong, that's fine. People who are really successful or really smart or really emotionally intelligent is kind of it's kind of meant for almost anyone to succeed. It just it's just about the context in which they are that anyone could be president. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's a huge part of what I was thinking as well. I'm struck by that again and again and again. And it's a very old-fashioned way of thinking about the presidency. Think about how often people talk about how. Political privilege is what positions people for those roles. But then presidents and first ladies themselves say, no, no, no. No, 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 I'm an average American. People want a president they can relate to and who they feel is, is just like them. Um, they don't necessarily want a president that they feel is like elitist or they want someone who they feel like they can level with. Who they can relate to. And the first presidents didn't operate that way. Their notion was the people need a leader who embodies, who is in some ways better than them, but who embodies their concerns. And that's a very, very much born of, of basically notions of European nobility, that, 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 that nobles were born, not only trained, but born better. The notion here is that, no, 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 the president and the first lady should be just like you. They, they face the same trials. They're relatable. You know, the kids watch TV too late. Um, we have a president and a first lady separately, both writing about alcoholism, a very commonplace challenge facing millions of Americans. And it sort of casts, it's tr- it in many ways democratizes the presidency. The notion that a president, a first lady is just like you. It's actually one of the challenges Donald Trump faced because he's not born into the, he's he's so unlike most Americans. And Melania Trump is unlike most first ladies and unlike every first lady and unlike most Americans. She herself was not born in this country and many Americans were born in other countries. But the notion of a first lady who had been born overseas was something she had to normalize for Americans. I want to, we've got a few minutes left, and I want us to use these to talk about the transition. But there's one point I want to emphasize about these memoirs. Of the First Lady memoirs, which is the most radical? Why? You're all right. You're right. You're right. Why? And I say it's because Betty Ford herself is no radical. Why? She's very open about her beliefs, her struggles, about many different aspects of time. Let me give you the context for when she wrote this book. That whole issue of saying, you know, that the president and I sleep in the same bed and you all kind of chuckle at that. Have any of you ever seen The Brady Bunch? And if you haven't, you've heard of it. Mike and Carol Brady, they sleep in separate beds because it was initially, when they actually have the same bed, that's a big deal. That was perceived as radical to have on television. The old TV series, I Love Lucy, that was never permitted. 
Um, Florence Henderson, who played Carol Brady had previously actually been one of the hosts on the Today Show. You may not know that. And she was pregnant when she was on that. Do you know what the network did? They lowered her chair and raised her desk because they thought the TV viewing audience of the late 1960s would be offended to see a pregnant woman on television every morning. I don't know why they thought that, but that's what they thought. This is the cultural context in which Betty Ford becomes First Lady. And to then have someone who would write about matters as personal and intimate as breast cancer and alcoholism, to say, I supported the ERA even though my husband did not, was truly remarkable in its time. Last point, transitions. What do these books say about how presidential transitions are supposed to operate? It's cordial. It's very formal, professional. Professional. Like fines, like Michelle Obama writes about how like Laura Bush like talked to her about like schools for like their daughters and things like that, and it was like really welcoming and stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they talk. Yeah. That alone. <laughs> um, what uh, describe when um, what happens when Sarah Polk leaves the White House? Do you remember? First of all, who's Polk's successor? This is going to test your memories. What's that? Taylor. Zachary Taylor. Excellent. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, what is he? He's not, what's he known as? Old Rough and Ready. That's his nickname. Um, and do you remember how that inauguration operates? They ride in a carriage together. The incoming and outgoing president ride together to the inauguration a 19th century equivalent of what all of you are talking about. Laura Bush and Michelle Obama. Anything else from any of the memoirs, either presidents or first ladies, that you remember about um, the transition? Michelle Obama talked about riding in a limo with Melania Trump and kind of how that was a big moment, um, kind of in her transition from living in the White House to mm -hmm. a more personal life. By the way, that more personal life is them going back to being ordinary. It's not just that they're ordinary people and they remain that way, but the term in office ends and then she just becomes a, you know, she and Barack just become a middle class family in Chicago with two kids, when in fact they're not. They're a former president and first lady. But yeah, she talks about that. Anything else about the transition? coping with how, like coping with, like the first lady coping with the president not winning, um, like right off the bat talking about how like she thinks that Woodrow Wilson didn't win and she kind of just accepts that that's the will of the people and is like ready to move on sort of, but then there's still a bunch of stress like in the coming days. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Think about the impact of these stories because these are private moments, as I said at the beginning, private moments put on public display that says the transition is supposed to symbolize democracy. The transition is the moment in which an incoming president and an outgoing president, even if they are of different parties, like Polk and Taylor, or George W. Bush and Barack Obama, they are gonna collaborate to make certain that the republic stays strong. The presidents describe that in their memoirs. The first ladies describe that in their memoirs. It isn't just a constitutional moment of the peaceful transfer of power. It's a very private moment that's made available to the public. And I say that because people have a lot of really legitimate concerns about how the transition is currently operating and how it's going. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen in January. Like, it's entirely possible Donald Trump's just going to go golfing on Election Day or something. It's certainly going to be interesting. But we go into this with all this cultural baggage. For your entire lives, for most of my adult life, the assumption is presidents from different parties and their families work together to assure a smooth transition in all of these ways, both public and private. All of that has been disrupted. And I think that's one of the reasons when in the immediate aftermath of the election, you all ask these questions. You know, what do we do now? Because the president, the sitting president, 
and the president-elect are not communicating, their families are not communicating. There's no tea time right now for Melania Trump and Jill Biden. The kids are not getting, Ivanka and Hunter are not getting together. And it heightens the tension that we're all seeing now. Okay? All right, let's wrap up for the day. You did a great job. It's, it's tough material. And you did a great job getting through it. It's one of those classes when we really need to work through it together. You did a great job. I hope you all have a great rest of your week, a great weekend. And I'll also be in touch with you uh, for plans about what we'll be doing after Thanksgiving. All right? Have a good day. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org. Thank you.